uh, will devote their, um, their time, their energy, their offerings to. Um, we have uh, a list uh, of many varieties here on the side. Um, Kemetic uh, system is Egyptian deities, um, the Hellenic or the Grecian deities. Um, heathenism is usually focused on Northern deities um, in the Norse, um, which is Northern Europe. Um, many people hear of the Celts, but they hear more of the Celtics, which is the basketball team who get their name from the Celts, which is um, the Western European, usually the um, British Isles, um, Ireland, and there are some uh, traces of that also in some of Northern mainland Europe. Um, Druidry is also um, oftentimes mixed in with the Celtic system um, as they're more well known from those Isles as well. Um, the Dea of Turi, I think, I think I might've butchered that, I'm not sure. Uh, but those are Latvian deities, obviously not one that I'm familiar with. Um, many people, when they think of, of uh, paganism also go to the, um, the um, Wiccan um, idea and uh, belief system, which is more neo-pagan than it is based in older traditions. Um, and frequently, their thought processes and their ideas for how they do things are um, taken from multiple systems. So they're not really their own. It's more of an eclectic mix. And then we threw in some others here that we found that were interesting. Uh, there's kitchen witchery, which usually these individuals work with, um, with food and with cooking and, and get a lot of their practice in with nourishing their bodies. Uh, Reconstructionist groups are usually based on traditional um, writings and, and stories that they can find that still have what would be considered the original ideas um, with regards to uh, worship and how you celebrate lives and, and the year. Uh, there's also the pre-Christian Roman faith um, which is currently called the Religio Romano, and then the Strigaria, which is um, Italian witchcraft outside of Rome. And um, you'll have to forgive me on this one, Britain. I could not remember what spin was. Do you want to give us that information? Yeah, I can do that. So spin is something we found in our research that um, kind of helps individuals who are outside paganism, kind of remember what pagan is in a very small nutshell. Um, so with spin, you have segmentary, which is composed of many diverse groups, uh, which grow, die, divide, fuse, proliferate, um, things like that. It's mostly polycentric, uh, multiple, often temporary um, leaders, deities, things like that, and integrated networks. It, they form loose um, integrated networks with multiple linkages overlapping each other with a lot of common things such as multiple uh, memberships throughout, you know, one person joining multiple things, common reading matter, shared ideals, things like that. And a note, kind of just more of as you start, as, as counselors and researchers start to look into paganism more, you're gonna hear a term uh, called closed cultures a lot. These are certain cultures um, that a person must be welcomed into or born into in order to practice. You see it a lot with in more indigenous cultures who have been subjected to colonization and whitewashing um, because they want to preserve their beliefs. Um, you, there's um, the reason why they're so close today even is individuals will go in, not really understand the practice and, but continue to use um, these sacred rituals and practices. Uh, one common one that you see a lot is the smudging of rooms and individuals with white sage. That is a native practice, forgive me, I don't know the specific tribes off the top of my head. Um, but is a very sacred practice that is often taken by individuals who don't understand the practice. 
Um, so that's just a term you'll see as you do research. All right. Um, one of the main things we wanted to bring attention to um, is the holidays that are celebrated. Um, many of the different uh, sects of uh, paganism will have their own specific holidays that are special to um, their deities or um, special parts of the year that they celebrate. Um, the most common ones um, that we have listed here um, in the image also, it, it shows you what they call the wheel of the year. And that's how the, the cycle of the year goes through the seasons. Um, typically the holidays that are marked have specific, um, specific background and specific reasons for uh, being celebrated. Um, two of them are the equinoxes. Um, that would be Ostara, which is in March, and Maybon, which is in September. Um, and then the solstices are also celebrated as holidays. And these are um, celebrated because it's the, the two days out of the year where this, the, the dark and the light are um, equally off balance. So in the summer, you have extra daylight and less dark. And in the winter, you have more dark and less day. And those are celebrated. Um, with Letha in June and Yule in December. And there are four additional holidays and these are usually fertility holidays in the springtime with Imbolc in February and Beltane in May. And then in the fall, they're harvest festivals, um, Muthnasa in August and Samhain in October, uh, which also happens to be considered the pagan new year in many cultures. Um, under the umbrella. Um, it is important to note that these dates can sometimes shift depending on the year, especially with the equinoxes and the solstices, uh, because obviously these, these things are ruled by the turning of the planet, um, the figurative turning of the year. So they will shift from time to time. They will not always be the same day. And something to add, and you'll hear us say this a lot in the presentation is not all individuals who are pagan follow these things. Not all individuals who are pagan follow these general rules, these general things. We are just noting the most popular ones, the most you're gonna read about. Um, a good example with the holidays is there are tons of different holidays as Jennifer mentioned, such as uh, Saturnalia um, for your Hellenic, Roman and Greek pagans. Um, and soil for the Hopi and Sunni peoples. So it's just kind of a small note and you'll hear us say that a lot as we go. Um, these are some common symbols. You'll see individuals who are pagan, they'll wear them, they'll have them as tattoos, um, just kind of go through them. You've got your pentacle up at the top left. Um, it's one of the most common, represents the five natural elements earth, air, fire, water, spirit. Um, the inverted pentagram, it has a lot of the same meanings as the upright, but you see it a lot in your more um, satanic practices, uh, Luciferian and things like that. You've got the tree of life, which is growth, prosperity, wisdom, stability. The Ankh, who, which is an Egyptian symbol for the breath of life. Thor's hammer, which is a really common heathen symbol the, I'm going to butcher this, triquetra, which is a common Celtic one, and then your triple moon, which is a very common Wiccan symbol that celebrates the three different shapes of the goddess or whoever they worship. Okay, and um, for those that aren't uh, familiar with individuals with, of this faith, one of the things that we wanna make sure you understand is why all of this information is important. Um, before I get into the information on the slide, I, I wanna add this little bit of information. You, if you're a practicing counselor, you may already have clients who are of a pagan type of faith and they're just not sharing. They're in the broom closet, so to speak, um, because there is still a lot of stigma surrounding these faiths. Um, so you may, you know, if you 
make it known that you are aware of some of this information. You may find out that you already have clients that you were not aware of this being one of the cultures that they're involved in. Um, but as far as the information on the slide, um, with regards to being educated on multicultural aspects of this, um, it will help you with um, ethical uh, decision making, ethical uh, conversations with clients. It will increase your multicultural diversity that you can see as far as clients, as well as, um, you know, you'll be expanding yourself like our code of ethics advises us to do with regards to multicultural subjects. Um, helping to end the stigma against um, paganism in general and against uh, counseling um, for pagans and as pagan counselors as well. The, the stigma is still very real. Um, it's, it's very difficult to handle for those of us that are confident in our belief system, let alone for those that are new or may have just been bombarded with it their whole lives. Um, giving a safe space to be able to discuss these things with um, as far as you know how it helps with personal growth and any issues that may actually arise from it for clients. Um, for those of us that are in the counseling field that are of this faith base, it will help us be more willing to share this information with those people that, that want to understand but don't have the knowledge base. Um, it also will help uh, because there is very little research out there right now with regards to um, pagan practices and how they can affect mental health, um, what the effects of the stigma of um, being pagan can have on a person with regards to mental health, um, as well as any benefits that may be uh, there for uh, client as well as counselor uh, with regards to practice and how um, everything can fit together and make, you know, for your pagan clients who may be experiencing depression or anxiety or PTSD because of the aforementioned stigma, all of that research will benefit somebody in the long run. And that's really our goal with this, I believe. So something that we did was we reached out to different pagan individuals ourselves um, through social media means and asked them, what is something you would want a mental health professional to know or do that would be helpful to you as a pagan? Everybody who answered these questions knew that this was going in a presentation and consented. Um, but these are just some of the things that they talked about. Um, you know, there are differences in morality, restrictions, goals, and things like that between pagans and Christians. There is more of an emphasis on the here and now um, consideration of our spirituality and counseling techniques, which we will uh, get to. Refraining from saying things like, God has it figured out, or God has a plan for you, because there's very little reliance on a higher power to do day-to-day -day things. And... So these are just some things to kind of keep in mind as counselors, as we counsel pagan clients. Okay, um, to address some of the differences that you've been hearing us talk about, um, you know, you, you could consider pagans like snowflakes. No one of us is going to be exactly the same in any of our, our thoughts, beliefs, you know, codes of ethics, morals, or anything like that. We're all going to have a, a little bit of a difference. Um, some people follow, uh, most more commonly Wiccans follow something called the threefold law. And what that means is, you know, the energy that you put out, you're going to get back threefold. So if you put out positive energy, you'll get back positive energy threefold. If you put out negative energy, you'll get back negative energy threefold. Um, they also use the phrasing harm none and do what you will. Um, there are some schools that feel that that's the best way to do things and they don't ever wanna harm other people. And there are other schools that consider that controlling um, and closely related to many uh, pagans uh, religions of origin being uh, a Christian-based faith. 
or most of them. Um, for many of us, um, energy work, also called magic, plays a large part, um, which is specifically our, so our energy workers. Um, when you work with divination tools, um, dowsing rods, pendulums, uh, rune stones, tarot cards, um, even Ouija boards can be considered used for divination. Uh, many people consider that to be uh, part of a magical practice as well. Um, and there are, as I stated at the beginning of this particular bit of information, there are many different ways that you can practice in a pagan faith. Um, you know, there are, are many deities. Um, there are thousands of deities. If you look at all the, the multi uh, polytheistic religions in the world, um, did, there are rituals for so many things, um, rituals for coming of age, for birth, for death, for marriage, for just general holidays every year, there are rituals, um, as well as different uh, paths and different beliefs. Some choose to believe in car reincarnation, for example, others don't. Some believe that there is a very specific direction with very specific steps that you need to follow to find um, their own type of enlightenment. And then there are those of us that see it as a spiral and we repeat the same lessons over and over until we finally learn them and move on to learning just another lesson and keep progressing in that way. So kind of to talk about how to incorporate a individual who of Hagen's beliefs into practice. One of the key elements in pagan practice is, and I'm gonna butcher this, eudaimonia or happiness, personal growth, autonomy, uh, positive relations with others, purpose in life, environmental mastery and autonomy are kind of the key elements there. And as counselors, it's pretty easy to find theories and strategies that work with those ideas and morals. Um, the theory of psychological well-being, self-determination theory, even existential and humanistic theory all really fall into that and are easy to kind of manipulate into our clients' spirituality and religion. Um, Jungian psych is on there because some individuals who are pagan will use Jungian psychology to describe what they believe in or describe who they follow. Um, for example, uh, an Egyptian goddess, Isis, could be seen as a mother goddess and, fix, and fits that mother archetype of Jungian psychology. And while that is, you know, the, the deities are a little more complicated than that as you hear pagans talk more and more about it, that's kind of a bare bones way of understanding. Um, so with some strategies, something popular right now in pagan circles is called shadow work. And it's working with the shadow part of ourselves, our insecurities, our traumas, things like that. And in counseling, there's tons of strategies to be able to coincide with that. One of them is inner child work um, and helping to heal an individual's inner child if they've dealt with childhood trauma. Another big one that we talk that we learn a lot about is mindfulness. Um, a lot of pagans, when you tell them mindfulness, they're gonna, they're gonna know what you're talking about. And so different mindfulness strategies work really well also. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs because self-actualization is a big part of a lot of pagans' lives. You know, they wanna reach that self-actualization and you can break it down using Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, well, we need to do this, 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 and this first before we can reach that self-actualization. Um, these are just some examples. There are tons of others. Um, going back to mindfulness and connection with everyday rituals. Um, one that I thought of God, a few hours ago was it's called, it's whenever you take a shower, you imagine you know, the golden light washing away your negativity from that day. And that's, you know, both something you can use in mindfulness and incorporate into a pagan based practice. So there's tons of them and all it takes is kind of a little knowledge 
an understanding of what paganism is. Okay, we've talked um, already, obviously, um, a bit about the stigma that surrounds paganism and it's, it's multi-tiered or multifaceted uh, contents under the umbrella. Um, there's lots of discrimination um, against pagans and in recent years it has seen a resurgence um, thanks to white nationalists using heathen and Celtic symbols um, for their groups, for their, you know, their flyers, their memes, or whatever else they want to put out there on those things, um, appropriating these symbols and, and turning them into something ugly when they are truly not and have a much deeper, much more um, transcendent meaning than being hateful. Um, so you don't want to assume if you come across a, a heathen or a Celtic pagan that they are um, a member of the white nationalist groups out there. Um, there are also many issues amongst the LGBTQ plus and other um, minority groups within the pagan umbrella because you know that intersectionality of they are you know LGBTQ or they're um, Latinx or they are, you know, uh, Hindu even, and people don't understand that. They make assumptions about them. And then you want to add on top of that, that obviously they're, they're already a minority group, but now they're a minority within a minority. Um, one example of that would be the levels of um, transphobia that are in Wiccan circles. Um, they are very, um, uh, dyadic in their thinking. It's masculine and feminine. You have to have the masculine with the feminine. And if you have someone who comes in who blurs that line, it can throw things off um, as far as where there's their, the practice is concerned. Um, I actually want to take this moment, especially under this particular slide, um, I've experienced uh, discrimination for my beliefs in multiple areas. Um, personally, I experienced it when I first came out to my parents as being pagan. Um, my mother was Roman Catholic and I was told with no shame from her whatsoever that I was going to hell. Um, my father, who was a profound and, and preferred atheist at that point, basically just told me I was stupid because I believed in anything. Um, so that was my first experience with that. And then um, later in a career that I had for close to a decade, I had a coworker um, who invited me along on a, what I thought was a women's retreat. And it turned out to be a, um, let's convert the witch um, for her church. They spent the whole weekend uh, trying to convince me that I was going to hell and that I needed to repent so that I wouldn't. And they had no interest in hearing or understanding that those aren't my beliefs and that's not where I'm going to go because I don't believe in that. Um, and it doesn't even stop there. Um, my first uh, round of residency um, within the uh, Chicago schools programming, um, the CMHC program specifically, I had made a few friends um, the first couple of days and because it was hot out one day, I decided to wear a tank top, which revealed a shoulder tattoo of a, um, an upright pentacle that I got for protection for myself. And after these ladies saw my tattoo, they wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't sit with me to eat anymore. Um, and it was just pretty much made clear that I was not welcome anymore in that circle. So it's, it's a very real thing to experience this. And to kind of build off of that, um, it, it is living, especially when you live in the states that are considered in the Bible Belt um, or more Christian-based states, I, uh, I have faced discrimination from friends and family myself. I had people who didn't want to come to my wedding because while I kept it as non-denominational, it was non-religious as possible, it did have some pagan rituals in it, such as a hand fasting. 
Um, I get questions all the time from my grandmother every time she calls me and I'm at camping with my circle. Um, you're not out there worshiping the devil, are you? You're not out there sacrificing. And it, it, you, it, well, yes, those are questions that a lot of people ask um, whenever you have to explain it to your family over and over and over again. It gets a little old. Um, so I have, to, I have to answer those questions constantly um, for my family and stuff like that. So it is very real. Uh, there's news articles about people who have stickers on their car. I will not put a pagan based sticker on my car because people will key your car. Um, and one report of telling the police, I read it in a news report, uh, the police went, well, it's your fault for basically shouting your religion to the world in your car, you know? So it's very real. It's out there and it, it's very real. Um, and to go along with that, there is a difference between pagan practice and mental illness. And sometimes they can look the same, but we've got to be able to draw the line and the distinction. Uh, one of them being the use of substance, substances, excuse me, in ritual, alcohol, cannabis, peyote. Um, there's a big focus on personal responsibility in the pagan religion and any kind of abuse and dependency is seen as negative. Um, but I know in my own practice, we use alcohol. We pass a horn of alcohol around. Um, we make sure everybody's of age and it's only for people of age, but that is something we do. And something to take note of is that a lot of recovery plans are not pagan friendly. Um, some of them are more geared toward your Christian values. I know AA and NA tend to be more geared toward Christian values. And there's not a lot of pagan friendly recovery centers out there. Um, back to the use of divination and magic, tarot cards, palmistry, spells, these can all be assumed to have a mental illness background to them. Um, when they're not, you know, somebody sitting in their room, lighting incense, drawing out tarot cards in a spread, doesn't mean they have a delusion or anything like that. That's their way of talking to their spirit or their God that they worship or even the universe itself. Um, and you can relate it to Christian based prayer. Honestly, it's, that's, that's a pagan's way of doing it. Um, and to lead into that is talking to the spirits, fae or fairies, deities, etc. Um, again, it can be seen as hallucinations or delusional or, you know, things of that nature when it's really not, it's just pagan practice. And like I said, going back to kind of relating it. If you, if you want to try and find a relation there in your major world religions, Christianity and things like that, it's, it's a form of prayer. It's a form of making offerings to an offering plate. It's a form of tithe um, and things like a tithe and offering plates. It's things like that. Um, so there, there is a distinction there and it's important to talk to your clients about what that distinction is. we went through um, and, and did some vetting because we all know the joy that is Google and the stuff that it can send you when you put in uh, a specific search. Um, so we found some websites here um, that are helpful for those who are looking at the possibility or may already be um, seeing individuals who are of a polytheistic uh, faith base. One of them is a list of um, faith-based drug and alcohol center rehab centers um, that are more um, polytheistic and geared more towards uh, Wiccan and pagan beliefs instead of um, being geared towards the Bible and Christian beliefs. Um, this is very important because many people 
of the pagan and Wiccan faith will avoid at all cost anything associated with the Christian religion because they've experienced so much discrimination um, and have received many, many negative comments and lots of negative experiences. Um, there's a, a joke that will go around in some circles where people will call themselves a recovering and whatever their previous religion was. It has had such a negative effect on them. Um, then there is also <clears throat> a list here. There's a, a website, um, Otherworldly Oracle, that provides a very good list of some very basic pagan beliefs. Um, things like uh, communing with nature. Um, and and you know, it, it goes, it, it, the article does its best to describe the beliefs without putting them in a specific context. Um, there's another one that um, I forgot to put on the list and that's my fault. It's called Learn Religions. Um, it's excellent. It has so many different faiths on it that if you wanted to learn about pretty much anything, you could plug it into there and it will pull up articles about that faith-based system. Um, and there are also community resources that you can likely find wherever you are. Um, and as long as you approach in a respectful way and without judgment, typically um, the individuals in charge of whatever group you reach out to will be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, and these would be um, like UU churches, um, Unitarian Universalist um, organizations. They usually, um, I personally was a member of one for a period of time and they actually welcomed um, ritual and, and uh, my input. Um, I was actually able to lead a couple of services and do some rituals for the church and they fully participated. It was an amazing experience and cathartic for me considering my Catholic upbringing. Um, there also will uh, frequently be, if you're in a, a large enough area or in an area where people are comfortable being out, you can find some open circles um, where a group will have an event at a park and, and invite people that are curious to come and see what it is that they do and what they talk about. Um, and you can also find groups on social media, you know, Facebook, you know, uh, I'm betting that Instagram has something like that on there. Um, I think meetup.com may even have some, um, you know, what the groups would be practicing or how, obviously, we can't know um, until you interact. But those are good places to get started if you want to look for additional information. We have um, some comments. I'll go ahead and read through those first. Um, there's one in here that states, um, it's from Heather. She says that as a substance abuse counselor, she struggles with the higher power aspect of the recovery process. Um, she has a recommendation that you read Russell Brand's book on recovery uh, for those that don't follow or practice um, traditional religions. Um, so that's another resource. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and Carrie um, has a comment about stereotypes that are associated with symbols and practices being is very harmful um, in the Bible Belt. Um, and that they get misconstrued as cultish and dark or harmful practices. Um, and it's our pleasure to bring the information out into the light. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so I'm wondering, what would, I, what would you guys recommend um, in a therapeutic setting? How would you um, approach um, if you don't know some, if that's um, somebody's preference, if they have pagan practices, how would you open the door, or create a platform for that in a therapeutic setting? Um, personally, I would say if you've noticed that they have any 
jewelry that looks a little bit um, conspicuous, like you can see a chain, but it's in their shirt. Maybe ask them what's on their necklace. And then if it's a symbol that you recognize that can open the door. Um, oftentimes they'll actually, like I will, because of where I live, it's hard for me to be able to express for the similar reasons to Britain. So I'll wear things and I'll put this close to my camera to see if you can see it. But I'll wear things like this that make nature a forefront in my jewelry. Um, so there, that's a couple of ways, like pay attention to the jewelry that they wear, um, the clothes that they wear, because frequently people will buy articles of clothing that have something that will clue you in as well. And sometimes um, clients who are pagans will say things and they're so slight and they're so small, um, but they'll say certain things like some I know of will say, oh my gods or goddesses instead of oh my god. Um, and, you know, they might drop little hints about psychics. They might drop little things about crystals and things like that. Um, like Jennifer was saying, jewelry. Some of them wear crystals. Um, that's a pretty big indicator uh, sometimes. Not all the time, um, but sometimes. And yeah, just pointing out little things like that. Hey, I noticed that your necklace has a rose quartz on it. Can you tell me a little more about that? You know, oh, I noticed that, you know, you have a small tattoo of the Triquetra, which is a Celtic symbol. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I'd love to learn about that. Um, so that's a really good way to kind of open the door and platform for individuals who might be a little nervous. In my line of work as a substance abuse counselor, we do a clinical intake. And one of the questions that we ask during that assessment is, you know, is there any religious or spiritual background or history that you want us to be mindful of in your treatment? Um, and so just asking that question kind of right out a lot of times will open that door too. Um, you know, and they'll say, the most of the time, when I, my personal experience, most of the time people are very open about either saying no or yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Christian, I'm this, I'm that. Um, and just documenting that so then that way you have that knowledge. Um, and then I like the idea of like calling attention to certain like, you know, tattoos or jewelry or stuff like that and just asking to explain it or, you know, oh, tell me a little bit more about that. That's really, that's really cool or that's really pretty. Can you tell me more about it? So I like that. Um, we're going to have our, C, uh, our continuing education uh, polls posted in the chat, poll questions posted in the chat um, for everyone. Are you able to see them at all? No, ma'am. Okay, I'll try it again. While she's doing that, I was going to comment um, with what Heather was just saying that um, it's interesting because I also do that in private practice on uh, my intake paperwork. And um, it, what's intriguing to me or what came to mind is that I'll have a lot of clients that will acknowledge that they're atheist. Um, and yet, like, I don't have any that will be as open about um, being pagan. And so it definitely, you know, I think says a lot because clearly I think that there, there are, but there's just even more inhibition about acknowledging that it seems. I think I would agree with that because I've even noticed at times that, you know, I've asked the question in the assessment and they'll say no, but then I'll have them in either a group or, or an individual and they'll kind of drop those hints like Britton was saying, you know, they'll mention a crystal or something and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, and kind of pick up on those, those little nuances. Um, so yeah, I agree with that as well. I think people are, are less likely to, um, to be, at least in my own personal experience, be more forthcoming about that than they are even atheism or other traditional religions. It's, it's just another example of what the, the stigma and the harassment 
that can be received will do. It will make people completely deny their faith to everybody but themselves and just a few individuals who they deeply trust with that information. Um, it's, it's almost akin to, and, and I don't wanna draw the line and seem like one is bigger than the other, but it's similar to like, if you come out of the closet with your sexuality, you know, coming out of, of, you know, hiding with your religion, especially if it's different from everybody that you live with or around, it, it can make you feel very, very vulnerable. That's a really good point, Jennifer. Um, I, and I do see some parallels there about coming out, you know, versus with your sexuality versus coming out with your religious uh, preferences, you know, because it is a process. And even if you look at the processes for both, they're probably very, very similar. You know, you come out to people that you're more comfortable with first and then slowly, you know, start coming out to other, other aspects of your life, whether it's friends, family, work, social, you know, that type of thing. And so that whole process is very, is probably very, very similar and probably, probably parallels. Um, that would be an interesting research project to see what that process is like and how, how similar and how different it is. So yeah, good point. put my email in the chat for everybody. Um, so if any of y'all have any questions later, I know I'm one of those people that thinks up a million questions after it's all done. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat for anybody who does end up having questions or, hey, how can I learn more about this? You know, as a resource to kind of help out. Okay. There is um, a small four question poll here that we put up. Um, if you scroll back up through the chat a bit, um, we can obviously keep taking questions for any that have them. But while we do that, if you want to look through those and, and maybe come with your answers and you can post them in the chat or feel free to just, you know, to tell us even at this point. I just want to say thank you really quickly for presenting something like this because this is, you know, very different than you look through some of the other, like the schedule for the next couple of days. And this is very different than some of the other stuff you see on the schedule, but that's so it's so needed and it's so important and it's so vital. And, you know, as one of the students in the counselor education program, we're constantly talking about multiculturalism um, and we focus a lot on, you know, race and religion and age and that kind of thing, but we don't really focus as much on uh, this type of religion. We focus a lot on Christianity and Judaism and, you know, Muslim and Hinduism and that kind of thing. Um, but paganism and the different types of pagans are really not presented as widely. Um, and so there's definitely a need for this. And, you know, I just wanted to, I have to hop off of here. I have to actually go back to work now. Dang it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this has been really great to, to one, learn more about the different types of paganism, because that wasn't something that I was aware of. Um, and I like to consider myself pretty open-minded and, and open to these types of things. So um, you guys did a really good job of presenting the different aspects and ways that we as counselors can be more open and advocate for those who, who really need it. So I just wanted to say thanks and good job. That was awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so there is, yeah, I was just about to answer the one posted in chat. Um, when we were doing our research for it, it was all very, very few and far between. Like you'd see one posted in 2001 and then none. And then you'd see one posted in 2008 and then none. 
Um, so it's all very few and far between. Um, even the ones that we found, I found one that did an interview kind of like I did. Um, and it was very small and it was very generalized. It was five people at a college campus. Um, he asked about their experience in college as pagans. And while it's, it's all very valid, it was full of a lot of generalizations based on the information he got on these five people. Um, so it's very far and few between and it's all very small and generalized. I want to thank you guys again for coming and watching. Um, this is something that we're very passionate about and sharing and advocating for. Thank you so much. Yeah, pretty much everybody said what I would have said, but like I had told you, Britton, this was such a great topic because it really isn't talked about. I mean, thankfully I grew up in a very inclusive environment. So I knew a lot of, you know, different religions and beliefs and all that stuff. But yeah, I think we need more of this within the field. So great job, you two. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I say, I know, I think there's, no, we're the last ones for the day. I was about to say, I guess we better clear the room for the other presenters, but we're one of the last ones. Yes, I'm going to stop the recording now unless there's anything else you'd like to include. Thank you. Thank you.